All right, everybody. Welcome to the Major Markets Weekend Update with uh, Kirk and Shooter, mainly Shooter. I'm just here to facilitate. But uh, Shooter, how are you doing today? I, 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 you're in Florida? Well, actually, I'm in Tallahassee. Yeah. So how are you doing? I'm I'm good. Life is good. I just went through all that. Life is good. Yeah, you know, it's it's actually, you know, life is wonderful. I bet, as a matter of fact, sometimes it's fantastic. And then there's you know, it's, it's, you know, my father's in hospice. So it, this is, I haven't even seen him yet because my trip ended up getting, so my flight was canceled. I bought a new truck. We're driving. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's, uh, but, you know, I won't see him until this afternoon. So, uh, but uh, no, life's good. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I, I tre- keep trying to convince people that all the negatives are largely cognitive dissonance and, it's gotten worse with the internet because there's just so much pounding on us, you know, headlines and, you know, then cable TV and, or, or streaming and what, you know, however you're getting your, your news now, there's just, you know, sex sells. The other thing that sells is bad news. So we get all kinds of bad news thrown at us and I don't think it's terribly healthy. And for, in fact, I think it's, it's probably less healthy than some of the other things that we think are, are are unhealthy. So the bad news that's always out there is, to me, a wall of worry to climb most of the time. There are times where I've been bearish. You all know that. But to me, it's pretty clear that generation over generation, most rolling three- and five-year periods, things are, in fact, improving, that anything that's a negative period is a is a short-term negative period. And, you know, we just covered a whole bunch of, topics in the uh, uh, macro dashes pieces. And and I just think that it's it's clear to me that the world's getting better. Now, in the context of the markets, which can get overdone in every direction, where are we now? So let's take a look at, you got the S&P 500 up here. What are you, what are you seeing with the S&P 500 and what do you think's coming? Well, I, you know, I think that 485 is pretty much a given here. I mean, we need to break below our trend resistance bar. Uh, which was uh, 436.25, sort of that megaphone pattern that we have there. You know, I look at this as drive one, drive two group bidding, and a drive three with an overshoot at the moment. So we need to get back down below that pretty quick for this this rally to fail. Um, and we do have a nice flag pattern that's appearing here as far as on our tape itself. So, um, you know, I, I think we hit towards that 485 at this point. We, You know, we need a catalyst to drive us lower. Okay. So the... The thesis of the year-end rally and into January effect in play uh, really looks good. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at uh, you know now the Nasdaq's a little moody because really we're at more of a crossroad. It looks similar to the S and P, but with a different wedge shape. Um, you know this really is a crossroad. We put in a lower high, not a higher high, from our three eighty-seven ninety-eight. It's only like I think it was twenty-three cents difference as far as the top. So I look at that as more bearish. So quite often that's an indication of price rejection. So when I jump out to our weekly, even though I see this broadening pattern, you know, the, the one thing, the fangs, it's it's a crossroad for me. We need to get above that 387.98 and stay above it. Um, otherwise we do have a, a decent shot at a, uh, maybe a little bit of a, a correction leg. You know, I'm looking at this as a, an ABC pattern down. But I'm waiting for it to print. Let me try that again. One more time and I'll move on. I don't know how good the Wi-Fi is here. Well, let me just manually give you a visual. You know, this would be our A, you know, from our, our high here at 408 down to our low of 254. Um, you know, and at that point, uh, you know, we would break down here. I mean, which is our high at 387.96. And then equality, and I'll just pull this speed line down to give you a visual, would give us an ABC, something like that. So, Clearly, if we break below the 23.6 FIB that I have marked from a Fibonacci expansion tool, you know, which is based from our prior low, way the heck back over here, you know, where is that, um, in January 2029. So we're we're me- measuring the entire profile. January 2020. January tw- 2009 is where I'm measuring the okay. on the FIB tool. Okay. And then I'm measuring our high of 408.71 with that low... You know, I, I look at it as peak, you know, peak trough, and then our other trough was back in 09. But I'm measuring that entire pattern, which gives us a golden box up here 
right at our 50% FIB, about 447, uh, you know, which is up where our target is in the NASDAQ. So all of the counts to me are constructive to the upside. However, you know, part of my job is looking at the crossroads and identifying, you know, hey, what's what could potentially be in play if we don't get that? So I would say that if we don't get back above this 387.98 pretty quick and stay there, um, you know, the longer that occurs, the more likely is that we have that bearish outcome of that ABC pattern where our A is from our top and our B is our low. And then this is, ends up being our C. And then we get, uh, you know, or excuse me, this ends up being our A, B, and our C comes down over this where I've drawn the blue line. All right. Let me ask you a couple questions. Go so ahead. first off, equality. Explain that to people. Okay. Equality is where you have two particular points. So, for example, Measuring our top here, you know, at 407.71 and our low of 254.26. And then if we come in and we add in our 387.98, this leg has a link, right? That's A, right? B is not usually equal to A. Usually it's 50%. So that limits what I would call my, my confluence or my conviction to the pattern if the pattern was 50%, then my conviction would be equality, where C would be equal to A. So from 408 to 54, what's that, 150 bucks? So I would look for this leg to be 150 bucks to the downside from our top. So that put us down around 230. Okay. So equality to me is when it's equal. Now realize with corrective patterns, and there's multiple corrective patterns that are there, but if you look at them, you step out in time and you look at them visually, they all seem to equal a certain size. And so the corrective patterns to me, I really put them in three boxes. Equality, uh, you know, which would be down here around 230, or it becomes extended, which goes down further, or it becomes elongated. Now they can occur at any point in the leg, but those are the three basic outcomes that I look for a corrective leg to extend. Okay. That makes sense? Yes. So now I want to take a look at this chart a little bit more in depth, and then we're going to talk about something else and how this correlates to the SP 500. Awesome. So we had the A and the B. Right. And let's suppose that the C is that recent peak in a couple months ago, and that the correction that we got, which was what, about a two month correction, mainly in the Magnificent Seven, bottomed, what, a month ago? Yep. What if that was the correction? And we're just going to go straight up to 476. Yeah, then, well, that, this becomes, you know, it's it's an ABC pattern. Right. That um, is playing out in that leg, which is usually a 535 or a 353, depending on the direction that you're looking at. Right. In other words, that's a pattern of an ABC, a five wave, an ABC, or a five wave, an ABC, and a five wave. They're set patterns that can occur. Uh, so, you know, looking at the updated pattern, you know, our five wave is pretty aggressive here because this is, here was our five wave up, one, two, three, four, five, right? See it? All right. Okay. Then we got our corrective leg, the ABC, right? Yep. Right. So this next leg should be a five. So it looks to me like it's going to be a five, three, five. Okay. So unless there's a major catalyst to the downside, we're probably looking at rallies in QQQ and the S&P 500. If the Magnificent Seven doesn't lead which is the biggest group on both indexes, then you're probably looking at the equal weight indexes outperforming, which is what's happened lately because there is a broadening of breath. I believe we got to 88% or 89% of stocks all going up at the same time. Yeah. Um, but the Magnificent Seven wasn't crushing everything. So yeah. I think and that we're seeing- that, All of them weren't running. It was like we had a patch of them running. You know, So we're still seeing that rotation. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, the way that I look at it, you know, flight to quality, I, I think is very important in this market. And it's constantly been the theme. So even when we come off, we come back into certain names, everybody views quality. So I come back and I'm looking at, well, if you're an investor and you don't have all the information I have, you know, the technical tools, you know, what gives you more comfort in a company? And me, I always go back to that flat line of reserves, so, you know, not only having a moat, but a large chunk of cash reserves, especially if that had some kind of like Amazon right now is, you know, actually, it's a nice play if this flat plays out in the right direction, because I think it has decent upside. But that that moat of that cash reserve is is what I'm viewing is this flight to quality. And we're seeing that with the exception of rotation. So 
you know, I'm looking at like in a six week window. So they like rotate into Amazon, Apple and Tesla, and then they rotate, rotate into Microsoft, Google and Amazon as an example. Um, and, and that's where I see that flight quality occurring. And that really has been our theme all of 2023. All right, so let's jump over to the treasury market since it has a lot to say about what happens in stocks. Yeah, now our accounts pushed just a little bit. You know, we were looking for a little bit lower. And actually, last week it was telling us it was in down here around nine. Now it's telling me 92.64 is our next target. And then we do break down again and put in our, our primary wave three uh, at 83.35. And then we should bounce again to about 89.56. Now I've got to come out in time, be able to see that one. But our ultimate target three down here uh, when our wave five, primary wave five comes in, is at $80.51. All right. So I would be looking for an alternative count here because I'm not a believer in the inflation story. And we could we're... bounce right here. Yeah. I mean, so... just, just look at the RSI on the, on the weekly. You know, yeah. our confirmed low is here. So we've got our two. So, yeah, it's viable for a bounce here. Could do it. All right. So if you're an inflationista, what he just showed you is probably what plays out. If you are a Kirk slow growth forever guy uh, or, or, or lady, um, then I think you're probably going to see, like we talked about last week, TLT rally up to that one tennis range, give or take for sure. Getting to the eight day average there that he has, which is at about one Oh three. It looks like there, there certainly can be little pullbacks, but for the most part, you probably are safe selling puts on TLT right now. I think you're probably, because the worst case scenario is you just buy it cheap. In the meantime, you're collecting premium. That's a lot of volume coming in there. There is a lot of volume. I mean, that's, that's huge. Bloomberg, ha Bloomberg had a, a headline today that talked about this is the fastest growing trade, which is the lock in your long-term rates uh, because you expect rates to come down. As you know, I don't think the long rates are going to come down a lot. You know, I think they're going to come down maybe up to a point, which will be about, you know, half as much as the short term rates go down. Yeah. So we're going to see a more normal looking curve where the Fed funds rate and two year rates are around three. Your 20 year and your 30 year rates are in the four somewhere. Yeah. And, and it's 2011 it since we've had that much volume. Right. And it's interesting to keep in mind that the 20 year rate and 30 year rate are usually almost the same, even though the duration on the 30 year. And it's because people would rather invest in 20 year bonds. So it, it is unusual for the 30 year rate to really be much different than the 20 year rate. So when we look at a, a, a bet on long term interest rates, it really is more macro and the and, and the macro here is that we're going to get more disinflationary and deflationary forces reemerging, right? They, the, the inflation had a run after COVID because of the intervention and, and then supply chain concerns and all the money printing and all the fiscal stimulus. However, as taxes probably normalize, as, and really just that's, you're just going to see a wave of tax cuts disappear in 2025 because that's what they're scheduled to do. And as now, see the, the aging demographics continues and technology continues and energy gets cheaper, there's not going to be a lot of reasons for there to be high rates tied to inflation. Now, how that plays out in the next year or two, anybody's guess. Uh, I, I think that the market's already understanding that inflation's over. That's what, that's what the market believes. I agree with you totally. I don't know that that's going to be the case, though. We really need to close above on a weekly, the 91.85, that back test. So once we get the close above 91.85, the next low that comes in, if it's a higher low, that would be our indication that we're going long. So we really don't have that long. You know, we have another buck 50 from where we are for that to happen. Right. But if, now when I threw the Bollinger Bands up here, first thing I'm seeing is pattern. I'm seeing drive one, drive two grouping. So drive three. Now that could be there because I, I you know, I initially had my confirmed low marked here, but with our RSI, it's flipped to the lower low. So it's an overshoot in RSI. So, you know, the slope really is more to that degree. So this is has a lot of seller exhaustion in it, uh, but we don't see it in the wicks. 
I mean, the wicks are tight. We're closing on the lows of the wicks. I mean, on this candle, we back tested a little bit, but, but I mean, really our push, what you, what you get is this drive one lower, and then you get your final flush just a little bit below there and then it's done. And you can see that right in your candles. Now we close on the high side, but I would have liked to see them. I've seen a much broader bounce on that candle really to tell me that sellers were exhausted and then the close on the high of that candle. I mean, it's still, you know, pretty decent for, you know, you can see the, the each one of these lines that I mark in pink here or light red or vetted wet or wet, red or whatever you're going to say, they indicate the high and the low of the resistance or support band. So pink is resistance. In other words, it, it's resistance is playing a much bigger game in treasuries then support is. This is the only support bar you see on the chart here, which is down on the bottom. Everything else was a resistance band. So the broader the band, as you go up further, this is a huge uh, buyer exhaustion to be up here. Right. So now we haven't gotten into this band here. So that band dates all the way back to, where is that one going to go to? And just so people are aware, those pink zones that he has, fairly similar to the volume weighted analysis that I do. Yeah, they pretty much the same. I mean, you know, truthfully, so many of the volume indicators are similar. They just tell you a little different picture, you know. Yeah. But see, you know, this dates back to our 2023. So the Great Recession, this crash right here is what that high came off at. Right. Now that, you know, that's a very emotional rejection up there. It's huge. I mean, when you compare it over the whole history of the treasuries, mm -hmm. you know, so our our high was 97.66 and our low of that candle was 93.03. So we had roughly five dollars and or four dollars and fifty cents of range, you know, in in comparison to our candles that we're seeing now, you know, I mean, we're we're seeing a third of that. So we aren't seeing that kind of euphoria, and euphoria really occurs in two methods, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out, fear of loss, which basically is just the opposite of each other. You know, buyers, you know, just they jump all in and then it stops. Because now they they bought and there are really no other buyers. Um, and the same thing on the other side, when the sellers occur, all the sellers jump in full, fear of loss. They're selling like lunatics. Now there's no more sellers, so it stops. So that's one reason I spend a lot of time on buyer and seller exhaustion, because it's a huge factor in picking your bottoms and tops. Right. And, and that's largely similar to Wyckoff, which, which again, is yes. another thing that we talk about. So one of the things I would point out to people, we've told the story, or I've told the story a lot about how the hedge funds got involved with the treasury market because the banks weren't able to do it for a while. And I believe the banks will be coming back to the treasury market next year sometime. And what do we know about the hedge funds, right? They, they make three to six month trades all the time. That's what they're looking for. What happened six months ago in the treasury market? Who went on TV and did interviews and posted on Twitter X and everywhere else that he was shorting the treasury market? Bill Ackman, whole bunch of other hedge funds followed into that trade. So six months ago, right around April, May, you had a whole bunch of hedge funds short the treasury market. And they wanted to see that resistance area in pink get blown up. They wanted to see the price go through there. And what did we have happen a month ago? Bill Ackman said that he closed the short position. And now a whole bunch of hedge funds are closing their short position. They're all still profitable because they went short up around 103, 4, 5, and they've been covering since the low 80s. So they made a ton of money, right? about 25% times their leverage. So a lot of them, if they were levered up at 4, 5, 6 to 1, you know, they, they more than doubled their money. And some of them, you know, levered up at 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 to one. So that was a trade that fundamentally doesn't make a lot of sense. It makes sense for the treasuries to be around 100-ish right now. I think that that's the magnet that they're going to end up going to. They're going to get into that pink resistance band in the upper 90s. And then we'll see how it jitterbugs around. But ultimately, when the Fed lowers rates next year, I believe that we test the other resistance band up around 120. Now, do we break through that? I don't know, because I think that the rate cuts aren't going to be so tied to a recession as they're going to be tied to getting the banks back involved with the treasury market. So if we break through this next level of resistance, which is just above head, then sometime by next year, you see 
TLT pushing 120. And that would probably be when I got out of it. If well, there's yeah, a crisis, 20... it can go higher. Yeah. I think it all plays out by the first quarter of 2024. I, I think we are done on the downside regardless first quarter. I, I think at this point, because this is. Unless you know, we're, we're already starting... done. Unless we're already done. Right. Right. I still think there's one more lower low, just, just from the count. Even though the Bollinger Bands are broadening, they have to broaden quite a little bit for us to turn, you know, to, I mean, notice the broadening here on the pattern to the upside for us to just do it, you know. So we do this meandering roll. We don't have that meandering roll of broadening. We have a slender continuation look, sort of that slender continuation look, you know, bounce a little bit, get a little broadening, right? Put in another little high, and then we roll back over. That's what it looks like to me. Well, I'll make, so a, just, predi I'll make a prediction here. Go you're going to have a week where TLT goes straight up and the headline that's going to trigger it is going to be such and such a bank has a balance sheet problem and is asking the Fed for help. Yeah, that's okay. Going to, that's going to be the headline and it'll that's be a good Q, catalyst. Q1 or Q2. Yeah, that's good. So, all well, right, think, let's finish up with the dollar here and then I can let you check out of your hotel. Beautiful. So, hey, you know, we, we've gotten this nice little push lower on the dollar. You know, continuation down to that 102. Now that's a tailwind. You know, that leans towards my bias of, uh, you know, indices long. You know, um, and, you know, I still have trouble with come out and saying that I'm bullish because I, I really need the Middle East crisis to get resolved because, I, I you know, that that's still weighing heavy on whether it's a right bias or not. I don't know. You know, but I, I would sure like a, a ceasefire or something like that coming out of there. Um, you know, and then I would suspect that the dollar continues that lower trend. And I would think that we actually get a lower four than what I'm seeing in the count, uh, because this is a pretty aggressive turn down. You know, so this aggressive turn down. Notice these the historic turns down when it occurs. How similar is this pattern to this pattern? And then we got this. We got a flush. So that means we're going to get a heck of a rally in indices. So that makes the the Israel war really makes it challenging to chase that, but it does look very constructive to me to the upside. Okay, so I'll I will go. Here's here's my other prediction. Then I don't think the war spreads very much. I think there's some skirmishes in Lebanon, and I think that we do some strategic uh, bombing of Iranian positions in Syria and in Iraq. However, I don't think that Iran has the ability or willingness to fight a war. So I think that they're going to just resort to what they always resort to, which is playing the long game. And there'll probably be a terrorist attack somewhere, and that's horrible. However, I think for the most part, the Middle East war does not spill over, that the energy equation stays about the same, range-bound. And you see, as the Federal Reserve gets involved with the Treasury market again to, to help the banks... You're going to see the dollar drift down because interest rates will be lower. I think you're going to get through this resistance zone down to about 98 on the dollar. And I think ultimately you may even see the res resolution of the wars and see the dollar drift even further down, pushing 90. A dollar that drifts down to 90 is incredibly bullish for emerging markets, small caps, and U.S. companies that export goods. So I think that's very important to look for. And remember, in the context of Kirk the Dollar Bull, I'm just saying that for the next year or two, you probably see the dollar drift down because the worries in the world will dissipate a little bit. And, you know, then the next setup for a strong dollar is the next crisis, which towards the end of the decade might just be the boomers uh, retirement transition. So I'm, I'm, I'm projecting about a five year bull market is what I'm saying. In, yeah, in, and we could have a very, a very strong rally here. I mean, that's you know, again, my only uh, headwind for me is the Israel war at this point. But hey, let me jump over these three. I put up three charts for you of, of what might be good buys this week. Okay, okay. and then I'll I'll cut out for that. Um, so uh, you know, the Latin America forty ETF on the weekly. I mean, we're back above our breakout line, looking for a target of maybe thirty two from where we are now. You know, maybe some 25, 20 puts, depending on how conservative you are, right. selling some 20 or 25 puts. Right. This um, is you know, I think we, we do have a decent pop here. Okay. And this is fairly highly correlated to Brazil. Yeah. And one of our stocks is a Brazilian stock, and that's been doing pretty well. So 
you know, this is something that I find interesting. I, I, I like the Latin America story. So if we can make some money on it, that would be fantastic. Awesome. Then you'd mentioned R-A-K-W, you know, ARC, Next Generation Internet, right? Looking for a target of maybe 78. We got a breakout line overhead at 68.26. Maybe a little back test there, but then we head way out. Got to come out here, I think, to the monthly to see that one. You know, then, then we shoot. Yeah. So that, that looks really positive to the upside for me. Nice mound structure. You know, of my own invention, you just, you know, how mounds appear on the larger time frame. So now you know, you're they, an inventor? Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's jump over to shop. Uh, now, same scenario, except we get, I'm, I'm looking at the 78 number as our next breakout line up there. But, you know, looking for 122. Shop, uh, you know, I, I think has some decent upside here. 50% back is right there at that 110. Okay. I think we got a good shot at that. All right. And Shopify is a big holding in ArcW. So if you're if you're trying to avoid single stock risk, uh, that ArcW, take a look at the top 10 holdings. Beautiful. Well, hey, thanks for having me, folks. Yep. I'm out. All right. Have a great uh, holiday. I'm going to be in and out the first of the week, probably, because I've sort of pushed my days a little bit later. But we will try and keep tabs on stuff. And I know a couple of you had some posts in there. We'll catch up on those as soon as I get a hard line hooked back up to my machine, because we're going to tear this out and hit the road. All right, folks, uh, keep an eye on the webinars that are up on the YouTube page and um, and the articles coming out. And uh, the next couple of weeks, I think that any corrections uh, we should probably be buying into. All right, have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you very much, Shooter. And uh, I am, you know, terribly sorry about your dad. Uh, I Thank hope you. That you guys can. Um, He's had a good life. I mean, yeah. it, you know, it's it's something that's inevitable. We're just going to try and spend as much time with him as we can, you know. And find some peace. All right. Peace out, bro. Everybody have a great holiday. All right. Take care.